So what I want to talk about today is how the physical world and the digital world are moving closer and closer together. But I want to start with a bit of a history lesson. Because even though we have all the hype now about robotics and autonomous vehicles and IoT and all of that, many of these systems are not new. And anybody who's done industrial automation, process control, worked in chemical plants or manufacturing plants, you would have seen these systems a long, long time ago. I worked on two automated warehouse systems uh, back a long time ago, lots of gray hair. And I want to tell you a little bit about this because we want to tease apart what is really different and what isn't all that different from what we've known before. So we've had, for a long time, lots of automation in our cars. People uh, started complaining decades ago that people, normal people, can't fix cars anymore because it's all electronics. Subways, back when I first started working, BART was an automated subway system in San Francisco. We would talk about things like dark factories, in the company that I worked, we had an autonomous vehicle. Granted, it followed a chemical trail. It was the, it was the mail cart, but it had sensors so that it knew not to run into people, um, and it knew where to go and where to stop, and no one paid any attention to it. It ran completely autonomously, and this was, again, decades ago. The technology, we had embedded systems. Back then, we used Programmable controllers. One of the first systems I worked on was actually an Allen Bradley programmable controller. And we had robots. And we had actuators. So robots were interacting with the physical world. We had all of these things. So I want to tell you a little story from my past on those two warehouses that I installed all those years ago. And the first one, it was a retrofit of an existing warehouse. And this warehouse was so old that the controller was an IBM 1800 computer. I actually saw core memory. The company I worked for was having to get rid of this and their other warehouse that had the only two remaining IBM 1800s on the planet. And IBM said, there is no longer enough money on this earth for us to continue to support these systems, so we need to get rid of them. But that warehouse had been running for a long time on an IBM 1800. Now, it was a pretty dumb system. How you detected whether or not a warehouse bin was full or not was the crane tried to put something in the bin. And if the motor tripped, well, obviously it was full didn't work so well if you had something very light in the bin and something very heavy on the crane because it would just push it out the back of the bin and it would fall to the floor and make a lot of noise. That was how I learned how to work in noise, was working in that, in that warehouse. And the control logic all lived in this Allen Bradley programmable controller because the actual sensors we had on the equipment were not very smart. We could send something to the left or to the right. We could detect that something was there or not. Um, we could turn the motor on and off, but that was really all the smarts that was in the hardware at that time. The second warehouse I worked on for the same company was for a new factory. And so this was brand new warehouse technology. It was great. We had sensors in the bins that would detect whether something was in there or not. Communicating with the crane was completely different because instead of having to give step-by-step -step instructions, lift, extend, retract, resettle, we just said, insert load, and it would do it because it had lots more smarts in it, much more modern technology. But it was still a relatively dumb system. It was still very self-contained. A lot of the stuff was still hardwired. But it was a much more intelligent warehouse 
than it was before. And so, and this all happened a long time ago, so none of this is really new. So let's talk about a completely different industry. How have things progressed in healthcare? Well, you start with the old-fashioned way. The doctor is sitting in her office, the patient comes in, and the doctor performs whatever examination needs to be done. But then we start to get different kinds of automation involved. First is the separation in space. There's a company in, in India that does teleradiology. They realized that for hospitals in North America, when it's the middle of the night, it's actually the day in India. And as soon as they went from actually looking at physical film to looking at digital pro projections of the x-rays, they figured out they could just as easily send those to India. So you didn't have to wake a radiologist up in the middle of the night to read something. So you've separated in space. You could move on to telepresence, where the patient might actually feel like they're in, in the office with the doctor, but she can't do any kind of physical examination because you know, they're not in the same place. Maybe you move on to some kind of augmented reality setup with a doctor in one location and maybe a village health worker or a nurse with the patient so that things can be checked physically. To move on to maybe now, it's a doctor, a patient, and a robot. So the robot is doing some of these things. And then maybe you get rid of the doctor, at least for some things that are fairly standard. So this is the progression of what might be possible when you think about healthcare in this world where the digital and the physical are coming together. And that's what we're calling this. It's physical, now digital. And we want to talk about why those lines are blurring, what is possible because those lines are blurring, and what are the, what are the things that we have to think about because those lines are blurring. So this is a quote from one of the IoT pioneers. IoT is basically computation and data communication embedded in and distributed through our entire environment. This is not just isolated systems anymore. This is not just a sensor network somewhere. Computation and communication is embedded and distributed through our entire environment. That's the scope of what we are beginning to look at. So what might this, where is the difference now from when I started in this? I think one of the most important aspects of this is our digital model of the world is so much better. It has such higher fidelity. The digital w model that we had of that warehouse was very simple. It had to be. We got really excited when they told us, you know, we found it in the budget, you get to have 16K of memory, not eight. That, tells you how long ago it was. And so our model of that warehouse was very simple. We didn't know temperature, we didn't know humidity, we didn't know power consumption. We had a very primitive model of that warehouse, even with the more sophisticated equipment. We have increased flexibility in altering the physical world from the digital world. And this is related to that first point. You wouldn't want a robot manipulating a person unless you knew that you had a very precise model of exactly what that robot was doing, where that robot was going to be probing. Same thing with precision welding. Those robots can be much better at their job simply because we have a better model and we have better control systems. So we now have increasing ability to manipulate the physical world from the digital world. And we're thinking much more, more creatively about how systems interact with each other, how humans interact with systems, 
and how the world interacts with systems. We've got voice, we've got uh, touch and gesture. We have a much richer set of tools to communicate. We've got improved feedback loops. We can get information from the world more quickly. And this last point is also very important. The edges, if you will, the warehouse that I worked on, that was pretty dumb equipment. Even the really advanced equipment was still pretty dumb. It was very much a hub and spoke model. You had the control system and it talked individually to all the different pieces. And there was no interaction between any of the things around the edges. Whereas now, we have the ability for those different things that are in this world to interact with each other, to exchange messages, to control each other. So there's increased autonomy for the things themselves and also their ability to collaborate within the ecosystem of things that they have. This is a significant difference that vastly increases what you can actually do with these systems. So what's made this possible? Why are things so different now than they were before? One part is Moore's Law. More specifically, we have vastly increased processing capability at a much lower power utilization. Even though the computer that we replaced was massive, and we replaced it with a PDP-1124 that the rack was about that wide and that tall, it still wasn't anywhere near as powerful as what everybody's carrying around in their pockets now. And the power utilization has been significantly improved. And you can get this increased processing capability at significantly lower cost than you could before. So you can imagine spreading these high performance devices much more broadly simply because they don't cost as much. Ubiquitous and improved communication infrastructure. As I said, in that warehouse, we basically had hard wires to all of the things that we were communicating with. Now we have satellite communication, we have wireless, we have Bluetooth, we have dot, 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 dot. We've got a communication infrastructure that allows these different parts of that system to communicate with each other and collaborate with each other. That simply wasn't possible. You couldn't do all of those physical point-to-point -point connections. Cloud computing. I think this one is a little iffy. Um, you could probably do much of what we're doing without the availability of, of a public cloud. Elasticity is important. The, sh the sheer scale of the cloud infrastructure that we have available to us is important. Um, but we probably could have done it without cloud computing. Oops. Smartphones and the way they impacted the way we think about technology. We are much more comfortable now than even 20 years ago with thinking about things like instrumentation on our bodies. Technology is natural. You can watch toddlers play with an iPad and it's just completely natural to them. For many people who are, who are older, Technology is a mystery. And so our ability to start to bring technology into our lives, into our homes, in part was made possible by the smartphone. Distributed computing techniques. Now this is where I get to sound like an old crotchety professor again. This is nothing new. <laughs> Back when I was in graduate school, we had an entire curriculum around distributed computing. Everybody talked about problems like you can't really know if two things happen at the same time in a distributed system. How do you actually negotiate amongst multiple systems, particularly when you have unreliable communication? We're getting back into that world.
just at a massive scale. We have far more nodes in our distributed systems in this new world than the ones that we talked about when I was studying this. But unfortunately, we also have a generation of software engineers who never had to think about the fact that maybe a call to a service would fail. What do you do in that situation? So we've got some re-education to do within our industry. So what kinds of things might we see? What kinds of things are we already seeing as a result of the blurring of these lines? Well, there's a continuum that I want to talk about. Not too long ago, we were actually talking about quantified self, and now that is even uh, morphed into smart self. I strongly suspect there are a lot of people in this audience who have some kind of step tracker or other activity monitor. This, is, this one is relatively new for me, has a unique feature. It detects activity, both walking and swimming, and it is decided when I give a talk that I'm actually swimming. I guess I move my arms around too much. But it's not just step trackers and ac activity monitors. These things have goals and badges. You have other devices that are doing something, things like measuring the percentage of oxygen saturation in your blood and tissues. So we're getting more and more of these devices. There's been some radical innovation on tracking for people with diseases like diabetes, where they don't have to do everything at their doctor's office, and they don't even necessarily have to keep pricking themselves in the finger every day. So we're looking at more and more devices that allow us to understand our own health and well-being. And sometimes these communicate with our doctors, sometimes they don't. But we can use this not just to keep track of what's happening, but actually to monitor and adjust. The goal of these things is to make you walk more. And so they send you these little things, oh, you're only a thousand steps away from your goal to try to get you motivated. We're still trying to figure out the psychology of that because studies have shown that people are not terribly motivated from that except if it's, oh, you're only 100 steps from your goal. <laughs> Nobody's going to go out and try to do 1,000. Smart home. The movement into the home. Smart business or factory. How is this different from the world that we, we lived in before? Smart infrastructure. Most people have heard about smart grid, but there's a whole lot more to it than just the smart grid. And of course, a smart city that we're experimenting with. And overall, a smart ecosystem. So I've covered some of this already. Health monitors, activity monitors, entertainment. We're carrying around our entertainment with us now. I remember in the early uh, days of, of the iPhone and people were complaining bitterly because they couldn't listen to music and do anything else because they hadn't, when they first released it, it didn't ha have the ability to do work and entertain yourself at the same time. Organizational support, where you have all of these systems and it detects where you are and it sees that you have a dinner engagement and it's going to tell you, well, maybe you ought to leave now because Google tells me that there's a wreck on the interstate, so it's going to take you longer to get to your appointment. Or you're going to be in a particular city and your favorite band is performing. It can help with chores. Specifically, it can also start to think about how it's going to adapt to you and how it's going to predict your needs. So if it detects three times you go to Chicago and you always eat at, eat at the same restaurant, it will begin to predict that you, in fact, will probably go to that restaurant again. Or when you go to a particular place, you like to go to the movies, and so it will send you the list of the movies that are available and maybe even try to recommend one for you. So it, these systems are not just monitoring, but they are tracking and they are trying to predict 
okay, well, how can I be of help to you? How can I be of more help to you based on what I know you've done in the past? Smart home. Power consumption. One of, the, one of the guys I work with has written uh, a program that monitors his various appliances. So when he's away, he can see what's happening with the power consumption in his house. And he's added some things so that you know, if he finds he's going to be away longer than he thought, he, he'll turn off some of his appliances so that he re reduces his power consumption. Security. We've got cameras everywhere. There's been a lot in the news lately about the Chinese government and how they're using many of the security cameras to start to track where people are going. Remote monitoring. A colleague of mine, Neil Ford, has one of those magic doorbells that if somebody rings his doorbell, he can look and see who's at his door. He does not, however, have the feature that some people do that will allow him to open the door over the internet. I'm not sure that I'm ready to allow any person on the internet who has the ability to hack into this thing to open my door for me. I don't understand that one. Ambiance. You can control the music, you can control the lighting, you can make your house more calm. We've seen this in all kinds of movies and futuristic television series when somebody walks in and says, please turn on Bach. People are doing that all the time now with Alexa. Again, chores. Love the little Roomba. I just don't have any carpets. And adaptive and predictive systems again. So let's think about how the system might start to respond. If this system has a view into your smart self, so it knows your calendar, and it's noticed, that every time you have more than four conference calls or one with this particular individual, when you come home, you always want very calming music and you don't want the lights too high and you don't want the music too loud and you, you want the temperature just right. And so it's going to start to predict, oh, I see she's got one of those days. And so I don't even have to say when I get home, please put on the calming music, because I open the door, it detects I'm there, and the lights go to their nice calming hue, and my nice calming music comes out, because it's figured out that that's most likely what I'm going to want. So all these things working together to try to make my life better. Smart factory of business. Supply chain replenishment is a big one. Effective supply chain has an enormous impact on how many businesses operate. Security and remote monitoring. Again, this is nothing new, but it's getting more sophisticated. They talk about dark factories now, again. I was reading something that there's a new factory that's being built, and they will have four humans working in this factory, and the job of those humans is to maintain the robots. No humans will be working in that factory except to maintain the robot. Again, power consumption. Particularly in many industrial applications, the cost of electrical power for some of these organizations is massive. And so if they can do a better job of managing their power consumption, potentially working with the, with the utility, it can make an enormous difference for their financial health. Production line scheduling. If you know a particular shipment is going to be late, maybe you'll change the scheduling of the line so that you won't have as much of a gap when those parts are late. Predictive maintenance. This is a big one. It is far less expensive and far less disruptive for an organization to be able to plan to take a line down so that they can fix a machine as opposed to it breaking while it's supposed to be running. This is important in other places too. We're starting to see predictive maintenance algorithms for aircraft engines. And I'm sure all of you in this room who travel would far prefer that the airline was able to schedule the repair of the engine before it broke rather than you being at 35,000 feet and the engine breaking then. 
the more we can get those sensors into pieces of equipment, we can start to detect when they are likely to fail and therefore pull them out of production use until they can be fixed. Fully autonomous experiments. I was listening to, to a talk um, by someone, again, who works in industrial automation. And there are prototypes now being built of factories that can reconfigure the production line themselves. They can change the way they work together to produce goods without a person being involved. They know what their interface is to the other parts of the system. They know what they can, need to achieve. And a higher level control system knows what the overall goals for the factory is and will reconfigure the behavior of the line without a person getting involved. Reconfigurable factories. OK, smart infrastructure. S smart power grid. That's an obvious one, but other utilities as well. There was a funny story um, that, that, that I heard when I was working in London. And apparently, the London utility, the water company, actually tried to predict when the halftime was going to be for all the World Cup soccer games, because they had to reconfigure the flow of water what does everybody do at halftime? They needed to make sure they had enough water to fill the toilets. So that was even a while ago. People did a lot of that. We can do more of that automatically. Again, security. And remote monitoring. Traffic monitoring, for example. How are the roads doing? Taken in conjunction with, with something like autonomous vehicles, they could actually start to route people around congestion points. More of this adaptive and predict predictive actions. If you know when the factory lets out and they still have enough people to affect the traffic patterns, maybe you're going to route other people different directions so that the workers in a particular place can get home and not and not uh, affect traffic in other places. Smart city, traffic control, much the same as smart infrastructure. Service delivery, how might I make provision within my city to start to deliver goods? We would need interaction between the, the smart self, potentially the smart house, and the smart uh, business. Power consumption again, urban infrastructure, predictive maintenance, and adaptive services. So the smart city is taking all of the things that we've talked about previously and just upping it in scale. But the smart ecosystem that we're talking about is the collective of this. It's starting to think about what can we achieve if we have sensors everywhere if we have actuators that are actually able to manipulate the physical environment and then get feedback back into the model to see, did the action that I took result in the outcome that I expected? So how do we do these things? For this ecosystem to work, we need open standards and protocols. And we kind of went off in a bad direction here Many of the device manufacturers said, I want to have a closed network. I want to have a proprietary protocol. So if you're going to buy my thermostat, you have to buy my doorbell and my light bulbs and my refrigerator and everything else. Ultimately, that model is going to break because it just can't scale to what we need. If you're talking about an entire city, if you're talking about an entire country, one manufacturer is not going to be able to supply it all. Obviously, distributed computing techniques. We're going to have to program these devices differently. We're going to have to think about different kinds of architectures, streaming architectures, event-driven architectures, the magic buzzword, microservices. All of these things are going to, to come into play. We are going to have to take into account distributed computing, and in particular, 
We need to think about those techniques that allow us to focus on robustness and resilience. Because at this scale, the probability that everything will work all of the time is zero. Technically, it's vanishingly small. It is, of course, possible that there will be a minute in time when everything is up, but you have to assume that things are going to break. And so we are, we are going to have to start architecting our systems and designing our systems so that they can work with pieces missing. The way it's been described by some is if I have one part of my system that failed, then my entire system has one less feature. It just doesn't operate in quite the same way, but it still fulfills its basic function. And when you start to think about this technology going into traffic control and autonomous vehicles and control of the power grid, you want to make sure that those systems are resilient. And so we need to focus much more than we have in the past on graceful degradation of systems. Continued improvements in data engineering. We're going to have massive amounts of data. And that's massive on top of what we already have. One of the projects I worked on, on briefly, the uh, uh, square kilometer array, they estimated for one observation from that telescope, one single observation would generate eight petabytes of data. And observations generally last on the order of an hour or so. The more sensors that we have, all of those sensors are going to be sending things into us. We're going to have to make decisions, like how much of the, that data do we keep? How worried are we if we lose one piece of data? If, you're, if you've got a temperature sen sensor that's sending you temperatures every 15 seconds, you probably don't mind too much if you miss one or two. If you're getting positional tel telemetry data for something, you might mind a whole lot more if you lost one of those. So we're going to have to think about how we handle all of this data in real time and focus our attention in the places where we, in fact, do care when we lose a message. In addition, improvements in AI and machine learning. For us to be able to do much of this ad adaptation and prediction, we're going to have to have models that understand what these things are telling us. How does it know that I'm terribly grumpy if I have in excess of six hours of calls in a given day? Where is that data coming from? We've made massive strides over the last few years in the models that are available uh, in large part simply because of the sheer processing power that we now have available to us. We can throw much larger data sets at these algorithms than we ever could before, and the algorithms and the models themselves can be much more complex than they could before. We're also going to see a lot more collaboration between hardware and software, and design and usability and measurement. One of the things I think that this is really going to do for our industry, probably most of you were trained as software people. And as software people, we look at a problem and we come up with a software solution because that's what's in our toolbox. We're going to need more people who think more broadly than that when they look at a problem and don't just think of a software solution, but potentially think of a combination hardware-software solution. I know a lot of computer and electrical engineers who think that way. Some problems can be solved in software, but would be solved much more effectively by sticking some sensors out there, or maybe an actuator or something like that. So we need to think more, not just about software and software design, but hardware. And we're going to think about how people are going to interact with these systems. Because computation and technology is going to be even more ubiquitous. And we want to make sure that the quality of a life that we humans all have isn't degraded by the way we have to interact with this technology. We don't want to be scared of it. We don't want to be freaked out by it. It's supposed to be helpful. 
And we've got a whole field that right now has been focused primarily in the video game industry of how do you, how do you construct a virtual world, an artificial world? What should these worlds look like? How can we make these worlds places that people want to interact? How can we design these worlds so that the collaboration that needs to happen in them isn't hindered? And this is going to take visual designers, but also probably choreographers and storytellers who can understand how to script interactions potentially. And particularly if you're in a mixed reality, thinking about the choreography, how all of the, all of the avatars are moving around. This is going to be a fascinating collaboration between technologists and much more artistic people. And we need to have a society level discussion of ethics and purpose. I read an interesting survey about autonomous vehicles. And the poll addressed two different questions. The first question was, do you think manufacturers of autonomous vehicles should make them so that they value the life of the pedestrian over the life of the passenger or not? And everybody said to that question, we think the auto manufacturers should value the life of the pedestrian. Second question, would you buy a car that valued the life of the pedestrian over the life of the passenger? And everybody said they wanted to buy a car that valued the life of the passenger over the life of the pedestrian. We are still very conflicted about how we see this technology. And one of our responsibilities as technologists is to help make policymakers, politicians, decision makers aware of these issues and help them understand how we need to start putting in place whatever frameworks that allow us to have these artificial worlds. I was feeling particularly depressed one day and we were doing one of these headlines from the future exercises, thinking about you know, artificial worlds and artificial intelligence. And the first headline that popped into my mind was millionth person commits suicide in virtual world. Uh, there are all kinds of ways this can go wrong and we need to think about that. And obviously more complex systems thinking. The systems and their components, when you have sensors, when you have actuators, when you have this massive amount of compute going on, we are going to have to up our game in how we think about emergent properties of systems and how we think about what is going to happen when we deploy all this technology. Okay, so what are some of the risks? Robots take over the world, Terminator. <laughs> We're certainly gonna see an increased centralization of data and control. One of the scarier things I hear about from time to time is some of these uh, discussions on prototypes for smart cities. And you've got the device manufacturers talking about, I will give you all of the hardware you need for your smart city. Just give me the data. Would be nice if the citizens could be involved in, in that decision making as well. Humans can't keep it all straight or can't keep up. This is again a variant of robots take over the world. But think about it. Think about how much more quickly computers can do things. Brute force, even with chess a long time ago, could beat a lot of people. We now have computers that can beat the Go champion. And that's not because of just com compute, but it's the fact that they can do everything so much faster, they can look at far more scenarios. So what happens when we can't keep up with what they're doing? What happens if we don't understand what it is that they're doing and how they're making decisions. 
mas machine speed feedback loops and failure modes. There's an investment uh, company that no longer exists in North America because they got into a vicious trading cycle as a result of a, of a failure to use continuous delivery and deploy the same piece of software across all of their computer systems. And it bankrupted the firm in minutes because we are now in the era of machine speed feedback loops, not ones that are modulated by the speed at which humans interact. Data, data privacy, I think that one's obvious. But, but data ownership as well. One of the interesting things about uh, the advent of GDPR is, is the sense in which we are now having the conversation about who actually owns my data. Who owns the data about me? The kind of data that's going to be available in this new world is so much more comprehensive than what's available right now. So we need to have this data ownership. Certainly the potential exists for in increased economic inequality. We also have an increased exposure to hardware failures unless we mitigate them properly. So that goes back to that rob robustness and resilience. The more things that are under automated control, the more things that don't work if the machine fails. I remember uh, when I lived in Florida, the first bad hurricane that I experienced, none of my neighbors could get their cars out of their garage because they forgot how to work the manual key and they all had electric garage door openers. I'm, I was still something of a Luddite at that point, and mine was actually a manual, so I could get my car out of my garage. When they couldn't, I was not exposed to that particular failure mode. Security. Let's go back to the internet-connected doorbell. Hackers are relentless. They are going to con continually evolve their ability to break into systems. And one of the reasons this is particularly important in the IoT world, go back to those earlier slides, one of the enablers is the decreasing cost of equipment. The people who are making these devices want to make them as inexpensive as possible. It's very difficult to do software upgrades on a billion sensors, on a billion doorbells. So we need to start thinking about what is the threat model that is presented by these devices and how can we uh, do as much as possible to mitigate against that. So why would we do it with all the doom and gloom? First, increased productivity, efficiency, and revenue. Robots and autom automated systems do not show up to work depressed. They don't show up to work hungover. They don't sleep in. But as well, thinking about efficiency, if we can manage and we can monitor these things more effectively, we can make better choices. We can be more efficient. We can decrease costs, decrease waste, and improved environmental outcomes. One of the more interesting exa uh, uh, examples of this that I've, that I've seen is in agriculture where they are distributing sensors that monitor not only moisture, but also the chemical composition of the soil so that they can fine tune to the very different parts of the field what kind of fertilizer gets delivered. And then they have the feedback mechanism to say, okay, I put that amount of water and that amount of fertilizer down. Did I get the result that I expected? Is the chemical composition and moisture of the soil what I was targeting. Just think about the environmental impact of not wasting fertilizer. We won't have all the extraneous runoff going into our rivers. So the environmental outcomes can be vastly improved, and this isn't even talking about fuel efficiency or anything like that. Just something simple in agriculture. Safety, repeatability, and reliability. Computers don't make the kinds of mistakes that people do. We've been learning this for decades. Access to expertise, regardless of location. The ability for a doctor sitting in Chicago who's a specialist 
to treat someone sitting in Sierra Leone. We can, we can break down the barrier of geographic distance and make expertise available where it's needed. A more concrete example, I was on a flight about a year ago and we landed at the very first airport that you get to that was big enough for the jet after crossing the Atlantic because we had had a hydraulic failure. And there was nobody in that little Canadian town that knew how to fix our airplane. They had a mechanic at the airport, obviously, but he wasn't a specialist in that system. Some of the prototypes that are being discussed right now, you would have effectively a mixed reality system where the expert mechanic sitting in home base could work with the mechanic sitting there at the engine, sit, sitting there at the airplane, so my plane could have been fixed more quickly. You wouldn't have to train everybody in all of those systems. You could make that available to them. Protection from hostile or harsh environments. There are many places that we'd far rather have a robot go into than, than have to bring a human into. Increased capability. Let's talk about pathology for a moment. A path pathologist looks at slide after slide after slide after slide after slide. And particularly when you talk about things for routine screening, the vast majority of them are boringly benign. Well, what if you automated the recognition of the boringly benign? Even if you had a high false positive rate, you would want to make sure you had, a, had an incredibly small false negative rate, but even with a high false positive rate, you would still free up much more of that pathologist's time on the things that really require human brain power. Instead of having to look, yes, it's still okay, yes, it's still okay, yes, it's still okay, oh, that one looks weird. We want to increase the, the overall capability of the system by freeing up the human to be able to do more. Improve situational awareness. We can actually think about knowing more what's going on so we know what we're getting into. So what would the world look like? What can we imagine? We have to start thinking about what is the potential with these systems? That if we can have the ability to influence the physical world and monitor and see, did we get the result that we expected? And modify our strategy and learn in the background how to better respond to situations. What are the things that we could do? This is gonna require a conversation amongst people like us technologists, as well as people in many different disciplines who might say, I've got this problem. How can we solve this problem? How can we more effectively deal with these issues? What can we do to improve environmental outcomes? What can we do? What can we make possible? And then what are our responsibilities? And first and foremost, our responsibility is to help people understand what's possible. And secondly, what the actual risks are. When you think about some of the systems that we're building right now, we are building systems that we don't understand how they work. If we can't understand them, and we're the experts, how are our decision makers going to be able to understand how to deal with those things? So our, responsi our responsibility as technologists is to help them understand that risk as well as to see the potential. When we continue to, to blur that line between the physical and the digital, it is going to have economic Implications. It's going to have societal implications. It's going to have physical and sociological ramifications. We need to be having that conversation as a collective. This is not a conversation just for technologists, 
but we have to be in the room. This is certainly not a conversation just for politicians or just for business leaders because the technologists have to be in the room, but society has to be in the room as well. But we really want to think about what is now possible. How can we conceive of systems that will upset the status quo of how things have worked in the past? so that we can ensure that we take maximum value from this technology. So we need to free up our own imagination to see what will the world look like. Thank you very much.